Um, yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, I realise that I should have asked, uh, oh, I should introduce myself. Yes, I am Peter Guest, and uh, I trade as Vianova Archaeology and Heritage Services, and I'm going to talk to you today about a project I've been working on in Dorset, uh, an archaeological excavation, and one element of that project working with a special needs school. Um, but when I submitted my title, I made a mistake. It shouldn't be a colon, it should be a question mark. Ensuring heritage for everyone is for everyone. I, I assume that all of us in this room agree that that's something that we can all sign up to. Maybe the question I want to ask is, is are we making sure that heritage, in my case, archaeology, is really for everybody on a everyday basis? Now, I'm an archaeologist and a numismatist. I particularly study and enjoy studying the Roman period. And the project that I'm going to talk about is at Hinds St. Mary. And we were there to look at this very fantastic thing. It's an eight meter by five meter uh, mosaic that was discovered accidentally 60 years ago and is in the British Museum now. And it's one of the icons of late Roman Britain. And it's one of the most important mosaics from anywhere in the ancient world because in the middle of the main panel uh, is a figure um, with a Cairo behind him and for 60 years it's been believed that that is one of the earliest representations of Jesus Christ known from anywhere in the world um, which was found in Dorset. I was asked by the British Museum um, to run a fieldwork project uh, for the 60th anniversary so we were there for three years 21, 22 and 23 it's a research-ish project. We are there to contextualize the mosaic, find out where it sat, the kind of buildings that it belonged to and, the pe and how people might have engaged with it. Uh, it was also a training project. The people that were doing most of the heavy lifting in the trenches, apart from me, were students and young uh, early career archaeologists from Cardiff University and elsewhere. Um, so our purpose for being in, in um, uh, North Dorset for a month every single summer for the past three years was to focus and answer questions about the mosaic. Um, we also, for various reasons, had an outreach program. I was very keen to make sure that we were, didn't just go in and out as people did 60 years ago, uh, dig stuff up, take it away to London, and then bugger off and come back in 60 years time. So we wanted to broaden out our appeal and our engagement. And one of the elements um, that we did was to hook up with a local special educational needs school in Sturminster Newton called Eustock School. And we arranged for, we did a pilot in 2022. And then last summer, we had a two week program of outreach where we brought the children from this school to our dig. Um, this is uh, an overhead slide. Uh, sorry, it's a, a, an aerial view of the excavation um, at Hinton. The children walked or were pushed for about half a mile from the school to the bottom right. They came into the field and I would meet them and I would greet them. I'd already been into the school the week before to talk to them about what to expect and what archaeologists do and a few do's rather than don'ts. Um, and took a couple of my staff with me to show them that archaeologists come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. And I would meet them and I would greet them and I would introduce them to the, uh, the team who would work with them during the day. And we would then walk them from down here to the trench on the far left hand side, which was theirs for an hour and a half. Um, and we had one group in the morning and we had one group in the afternoon. Now, Eustock School, uh, which is the only special educational needs uh, provider in North Dorset, um, is a remarkable place. And I didn't know it existed until relatively uh, close to the beginning of the excavation. It's hidden away in Samuelson Newton. They get on with the things that they do. They do fantastic work. They have uh, about 200 children on their books altogether with a range of learning difficulties and special educational needs, some of them milder than others but some extremely advanced and very profound indeed. And we wanted to be as open and inclusive as possible. There, were no, there, was, there, was, there was no limit to how many children the, the uh, school could send or who they might bring as long as they were safe and as long as we had parents, uh, teachers, teaching assistants and carers who would come with us and help us. So prior to the excavation, uh, we drew up a learning plan. That didn't last long. Uh, because as soon as the children arrived on site, it was chaos and it was fantastic. 
And um, what we realized very soon is that the school's values, which I've put on this slide here, are not far off the values of the excavation or the institutions that, it, that uh, form the excavation. So it was a partnership with the British Museum, myself and Albion Archaeology, and we can all sign up as institutions and individuals to all of these values that the children's school holds very dear. So over 10 days, in the middle two weeks of our month, we welcomed 143 children with a range of different um, needs to our excavation. And we offered them a variety of activities, uh, which they could or couldn't do. It was entirely up to them. And as I say, our learning plan was relatively detailed, but I've done this kind of thing before. And I realized that actually the best learning plans are generally quite, not vague, but um, sort of general, I suppose, or vague-ish. If you try and pin things down too much, and if you try and tick boxes, then we're going to be in a little bit of difficulty uh, later on. We wanted them to understand that archaeology is everywhere. <clears throat> we wanted them to understand that archaeology is as much theirs as it is mine. Therefore, it is for everybody. We also wanted them to understand how we as archaeologists work, what we find and how we understand the past, and of course, how important the past is to the, the places um, that we live in. So we had a range of activities in Trench 6, which they could take part in. There was digging, there was sieving, um, <clears throat> there was metal detecting, and there was fines washing. We took pictures of all of the children that came with us, um, which is most of which we sent off to the school. Um, some of them for reasons of individual personal dignity, we don't show in public at events like this today. Um, but you can see, I think, get a good sense of the kind of activities that we did. And everybody had a whale of a time. All of the uh, activities were managed and run by student archaeologists or early career archaeologists with my support. Um, but all of them volunteered to do that work and all of, the, the, all of them did exceptionally well. It was perhaps, it was a, a very intense and intensive experience for all of us. Uh, it's definitely something that I think we should do again. And it's something that was highly rewarding for everybody involved, the kids, the teachers, the teaching assistants, and their parents, as well as the archaeologists too. And listening to the papers earlier today, and uh, as we'll see, I'm sure, this afternoon and tomorrow, a couple of things spring to mind, which sort of as I was preparing this uh, presentation, uh, I was thinking about a little bit more. And the first is uh, about evaluation. And with this kind of event, evaluating things in a quantitative way is extremely difficult. Um, to have a sort of questionnaire or to tick boxes or to grade things on one to five doesn't feel appropriate for this kind of thing. The children were not interested in seeing a form or anybody with a, uh, with a folder or a, or, a, or a pen in their hand. But what they were quite keen on was doing something like putting a little sticker onto, a, in this case, um, a uh, reproduction of the roundel in the very center of our fantastic mosaic with the instruction that the closer to the middle the man's nose, you put the sticker the best time, you, the better time that you've had. Um, Tierney Tudor on the left and Elizabeth Guest, my daughter, on the right, were the site assistants who essentially ran the events that I've talked about in the second week after I'd helped them. Uh, and they were both fantastic. The Nepo baby thing on the right-hand side, to uh, put, that to, put that to one side, it doesn't matter. They were both excellent. And as you can see, all the little green dots are very much in the very center. And Christ knows, Christ knows, it isn't Christ, by the way, we've now found out, but that's a different story in a different lecture, <laughs> was, a, was submerged under about mm, a centimeter and a half of little green stickers. So the kids had a whale of a time. They learned a great deal. Um, they, these are facts, by the way, that we've managed to obtain. Archaeology is fun, and yes, archaeologists are clever. We also managed to communicate to them the mechanisms that we have evolved or developed in the UK uh, for undertaking field archaeology. How do we know? Why are things important? Why are things more important than others? They clearly understood all of these things from a very, uh, uh, very quickly indeed. We also demonstrated and showed that we collectively, human beings, people, work best when we work together. 
um, and that we work best when we listen to one another and that we, when we try and be kind and considerate, that's the way that we as human beings can actually achieve uh, great things. Uh, a conclusion from that, from, the, uh, from dealing with them, is that yes, archaeology is and should be always for everyone. My last slide is really about the lessons that we learned or the lessons that I've learned. I've been digging now for 40 years. Uh, I worked out earlier on. And I've run big research and training programs before, particularly at Killeen in South Wales, where we had a very strong, very big community engagement element that involved all sorts of different groups. We were pushed then by a friend of mine um, who sadly passed away not too long ago, Rick Turner, who was Senior Inspector of Ancient Monuments in Wales. And he was very keen that we opened up our excavations, not just to the people, but to those people who don't normally engage with heritage and archeology. span He used to call them hard to reach groups, and they are hard to reach groups. And in that, on that project, we worked with MIND, and we worked with SCOPE, and we worked with reformed prisoners and all sorts of other people to try and use the power of archeology span uh, and heritage to do good. And it's easy enough to do. It's, it's just a question of setting these things up. But really, my sort of main thinking about coming into this um, uh, conference and preparing this paper is, I think I've put it on there, have I? Yes, lasting legacy is difficult to achieve. I find lasting legacy difficult to achieve. It's a challenge, and I need to work better at it and what I mean by lasting legacy is not whether we could run it again, another group of kids might come along, but lasting legacy for the children and also for the archaeologists who took part in 2023. How do we make sure that the impact we had in that hour and a half carries on so that maybe they go and see a museum, maybe they read a book, maybe they watch a program about archaeology on TV, Maybe they support heritage when they grow up. Maybe they see things in a slightly different way. And I'm not, I haven't cracked it. I'm still learning and I'm still trying. And an event like this is fantastic because I can see the kind of things that you're doing. And we're all sharing best practice, hopefully. And I'm certainly going to go away with new ideas about how to do things and how to make sure that the very great impact that we, we can make on individual people's lives in the short term carries on into the longer term. Um, and if I could sort of, oh yes, should be slightly easier to set up. It was a fantastic program that we ran, but it wasn't easy to do. It wasn't easy because of health and safety. That was relatively easy. Yes, you fill out a risk assessment. Yes, I've got a form. It was easy to find partners who wanted to work with us and who had money. Money was a serious issue. And altogether, those two young women that I showed you earlier on, Tierney and Elizabeth, I was able to pay them to come. And we were able to run this program on under 5,000 pounds, which works out, if you like that kind of thing, at about 30 quid per child per visit, which, as far as I'm concerned, is, is cheap, or if you like it to put out another way, is extremely good value for money. Small is beautiful. We were a small project in a small, in a small county near a small town, but our punch was a lot bigger than um, the size would let you know. And yes, we do work best when we work together. And yes, I've always believed that archaeology is for everyone. And I think that what we've demonstrated is that the audiences are out there. It would be good if we could not, because of the way policy is working and funding is being directed, if we could not forget young people and children, partly because, as my son told me only a few weeks ago, it's going to be people like me, Dad, who, when you're in a care home, clean you up and put you to bed. So I think we need to definitely make sure that we don't forget kids because they've got very long memories and we don't want them to take it out on us later on. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's been a great, uh, great conference and I'm learning a great deal too. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Again, lots of resonances with some of the experiences we've had. Um, I'm just thinking, Nicola, could I charge you with being my external accountability timer? Um, 
it's just that I know I'll get carried away and then I'll talk forever and that's not really very fair. So let me just um, find my presentation. One moment, just talk amongst yourselves. There we go.